Simply put, is Israel the real deal? No other nation on earth stirs up such strong emotional reactions and diverse reactions as the nation of Israel. On one hand, some people see it as a strong and dynamic democracy and key U.S. ally in the Middle East. Others see it as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy that heralds the return of the Messiah. On the other hand, detractors see it as a failed United Nations nation-building experiment that has not only failed but has now caused all the problems in the Middle East. Many Christians believe Israel is irrelevant, that it has been cursed, rejected by God, and has been replaced by the church. There are even some that would accuse it of being a conspiracy of a powerful Jewish cabal or a Luciferian cabal, or, or both cabals, and that they've come to create this abomination before God, that Israel is actually an abomination of man trying to accomplish what God said he would accomplish. <laughs> now that's a lot to explore in our first documentary, so let's get right into it and let's get complex. Greetings and salutations. Hello, my name is Phil Fansteel, and this is The Phil Files. As a child, I was taught by my Christian parents that Israel was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and that God still had a plan for Israel. However, as I grew up, I started studying things and I visited Turkey and most recently the Israel and the occupied territories. Uh, and I've learned a lot over this time as well uh, by talking to people, reading books, I've learned and teaching. Uh, I taught this in my class for six, seven years uh, as a public school teacher. And as I've gone over this, I've learned a lot. I've learned about the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, the UN, the Rockefellers, the uh, Teletubbies. Oh, wait, that's a different video. Um, a Jewish cabal. I've read about the elders of the Protocols of Zion. I've talked to Muslims and Jews and Christians and secularists all over the world. And all this information, instead of being helpful to me, <laughs> has been like a flood that has overwhelmed me. Now, I've come through this flood and want to explore and share what I've discovered about this very complex and confusing topic. Let's start with the facts and then try to put them into a proper context into, into this puzzle. Is Israel a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I can't say. No one can say for sure. However, when we look at the Jewish and Christian scriptures, we discover that there are over a dozen different references to a rebirth of Israel in the latter days. The most obvious it comes from Ezekiel 37, 21 through 27. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I'll make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. So did God create the nation of Israel? On the surface the answer is no. The state of Israel was created on May 14, 1948, after being approved by the United Nations on November 29, 1947. And why did the UN approve the state of Israel? The first of the three largest factors were the Balfour Declaration at the closing days of World War I. In this declaration, Britain, France, and other nations promised to make, take the remnants of the Ottoman Empire and create both Jewish and Arab states. And to be fair, they did. They, the League of Nations and successor of the UN created Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and many other Arab nations from this mandate. Many of these nations were formed around Arab allies of the Allies during World War I. Lawrence of Arabia is a great movie that gives insight into this period of history. But Israel wasn't created after World War I. Despite numerous conflicts and rising pressure from both Arabs and Zionists. FYI, Zionism is a term used to describe people, uh, Jews and non-Jews, that support the creation of a Jewish state in the Holy Land. Many Jews trying to immigrate to Palestine before World War II were prevented by British immigration restrictions. Sadly, many of these would-be immigrants uh, were returned to Germany and Eastern Europe where they died in the Holocaust. So the second factor was the Holocaust. The deliberate slaughter of six million Jews by the Nazis was a wake-up call to the world about the demonic nature of anti-Semitism. Quick aside, anti-Semitism. What is that? 
Well, anti-Semitism simply means against the Semitic people. But who are the Semitic people? Semitic people are descendants of Abraham. Both Jews, Hebrews, and Arabs are all descendants of Abraham. But where does Semitic come from? Well, Semitic actually goes back all the way to Noah's son, Sham. Sham, who was the father, like a great great grandfather of Abraham, um, the, his descendants became known as the Shemetic people. And over time, this has changed to Semitic. But it actually goes all the way back to Sham. Now, that is another document he had another time, following the line of succession from Adam all the way to Noah, and then through his son Sham all the way to Abraham. Fascinating. We'll have to get into that later time. FYI, Jew is short for Judah. Now, Judah was the one of the 12 tribes. He was actually one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And Jacob, when he, his name was changed to Israel. And so his sons, each of his sons, became the father of their own tribe. So Israel, Israel is made of 12 tribes. All right. Now, Judah was the last fully surviving tribe. Uh, after King Solomon, King David, King Solomon, Israel divided into the northern 10 tribes, known as Israel, and the southern two tribes known as Judah collectively. Now these included Levi, uh, the people from the tribe of Levi, and people from the tribe of Benjamin, and some others mixed in there as well. The other ten tribes were dispersed uh, by the Assyrians when Assyria invaded 2,500 years ago into what was known as the Kingdom of Israel, and they dispersed these tribes all over the world. These became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. But Judah, the descendants of Judah, and then Benjamites and Levites mixed in, now they're collectively known as Jews. Now, the third factor that led to the creation of Israel was that after World War II, many Europeans, uh, either because, because of guilt or earnest feelings, backed this idea of creating a Jewish homeland. In America, which was predominantly Christian, uh, there was a lot of sympathy, and still is a lot of sympathy, toward Israel. And so, of course, they backed the creation of Israel. A most notable of these was Harry Truman. Harry Truman had been, uh, President Harry Truman, <laughs> he had been taught by his mother as a child that God would reestablish the state of Israel. So, lo and behold, he ends up as president, which was a, a fluke. Uh, <laughs> he could never have gotten elected, but President Roosevelt chose him. Uh, and it was very interesting, very interesting man, a lot of, lot of a story there. But um, so he was a driving force behind the UN as a president of the United States um, and one of the key founders of the UN. He was a driving force behind uh, America's push uh, to support Israel. Now these three streams, the Balfour Declaration, the Holocaust, and the emerging sympathies toward the Jews, uh, led the United Nations to passing Resolution 181, which called for the partition of the Palestinian Mandate that was left over from World War I uh, into Jewish and Arab states. Now the Jews agreed to this and on May 14, 1948 declared their statehood. The Arabs did not agree to it, so the very next day armies from every neighboring Arab country attacked Israel. This became known as the this is the, the official start. It had been going on long before this, but the official start to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and uh, Israel merged after these attacks, emerged victorious, and actually ended up with more land than was originally approved by the UN mandate. Needless to say, the very complex Arab-Israeli conflict is beyond the scope of this documentary. We're going to focus on what is Israel. So, going back to our question about was it biblical prophecy, essentially the UN created Israel in 1947, not God, right? One of the conspiracy claims is that a giant Jewish Zionist cabal has been active since the late 1800s, it's, it's, it's trying to kick the Arabs and Muslims out of the Middle East. Uh, but according to the Wilder theories, this, the Cabal's plan doesn't stop there. It actually goes to taking over the entire world. And this is actually popularized by Henry Ford, maker of Ford automobiles, in one of his books, which was, again, pushed by Hitler in Nazi Germany. 
Now, the document most often used to support and promote this plan is a, a document known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. While the source of this book has been debunked by scholars, the influence of, on Muslims throughout the world cannot be denied. I learned about this book myself while talking to Muslims from Egypt, Palestine, Kuwait, uh, and Turkey. They presented it to me not as a fanciful literature, but as actual fact. Uh, and this is in the last 10 years where I've had these conversations. The, they presented as actual fact and proof of a worldwide Jewish conspiracy. My fencing instructor from Egypt connected this book to the purported CIA Mossad operation uh, that Americans know as 9-11. Now, this is the first time I'd heard from someone about the inside job conspiracy theory. Yes, that will be another documentary for, an, for another day. While most, if not all, scholars understand the protocols as sloppy, racist, plagiarized propaganda that actually originated during the reign of Napoleon III in France and then was plagiarized and copied in Russia into what became known as the protocols, the light this propaganda has taken on the streets from Nazi Germany to the modern-day Middle East cannot be dismissed. This leads to the common refrain that Israel is the cause to all the problems in the Middle East. In Iran, they shout death to America and death to Israel. <laughs> they call America the great Satan, Israel the, the little Satan. In the Middle East, Hezbollah and these other terrorist uh, radical organizations call repeatedly for the annihilation of the Jewish state and kicking them into the sea. Um, and so this in, in simplistic solution to the Middle East is goes back to these protocols. If we just kill this giant Jewish cabal, then all of our problems will be solved. As I mentioned, the Arab-Israeli conflict is a <laughs> documentary for another day. But for now, let's suffice to say that the protocols provided useful propaganda that has been used throughout the Middle East um, by dictators and imams alike. Before the Arab Spring, every country in the Middle East was a dictatorship. Now, some dictators were despised more than others, but the need to control the media and the people was obvious. Protest against tyrannical leadership could not be allowed. We saw what happened in 2011 with the Arab Spring when these protests could no longer be contained. But for 60 years before the Arab Spring, these frustrations, anger, and disillusionment with the quality and freedom of life had to be channeled. My own conclusion is that the states did and still do channel this toward the Arab-Israeli conflict for the simple fact of efficiency. Anger, frustration, and dissatisfaction has to be channeled at something and Israel becomes the easy scapegoat. This is clearly seen in the number of anti-Semitic cartoons found throughout the Middle East to this day. Basically, Israel becomes the boogeyman that all Muslims can unite against. No one was permitted to question, criticize, or protest the decisions of their dictators, but you could say any and everything vile and nasty about Israel. In America, our frustration can be focused on the source of the frustration because of our current freedom of speech, if political correctness doesn't suffocate it. In the Middle East, the narrative that the Jews, Israel, are the cause of all their problems is a convenient, if not self-destructive, narrative. While Israel is a player in the conflict, to say it is the source of all the problems in the Middle East is a little silly. Simply imagine the Middle East without Israel. Would that solve all the problems? Would the Sunni and Shia suddenly become BFFs? Would the Turks and the Kurds join together in some Islamic version of Kumbaya? Would the Christian, Yazidi, Druze, and other minorities all of a sudden feel the warmth and goodwill of the Muslim majorities as they fork over their jizya? Would dictators and destitute suddenly embrace and carpool together to work? I don't think so. I'll admit that Israel is part of the problem and part of the solution if you'll admit that blaming them for everything is a little bit childish. I know you are, but what am I? Oh, sorry, did you hear that? Um, what about uh, the conspiratorial claims that Israel uh, is a creation of the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Masonic Illuminati or Luciferian elites? 
Now, before he dismissed those, uh, <laughs> my eyes were open to, to this, and I, I don't know enough about it to really cover it here, but um, there's a great video by Leonard Ulrich about secret societies that I highly recommend. Now, I don't agree with everything he comes to in this video, but the, his research and the connecting of the dots is very compelling. Um, now, my first reaction when I heard about these secret societies, and, and I have relatives, uh, grandparents and so forth, great-grandfathers and grandparents, that were in the Masonic order. Um, and when I first heard about these, the, the thought that struck my head is uh, with the Rothschilds and these others is the uh, Synagogue of Satan. If what they say about them is true, which again is debatable, but let's say for the sake of argument that it is, Jesus actually warns us about people that claim they are Jews, but that are not. It's in the Revelation. And Jesus says it twice. Uh, he talks about the synagogue of Satan. Now, when that was translated, it's interesting. When you translate synagogue, the, immediately we think Jew. Uh, and we say church, we think Christian. Well, in Greek, the word for synagogue and the word for church are the same word. It's, it basically means assembly or gathering. So when it's referred to Jews, they use synagogue. When it refers to Christians, they use church. So really, this could just as well mean the church of Satan. <laughs> the synagogue or the gathering of people that are worshiping Satan. But for the sake of this video, let's assume that every conspiracy you've ever heard about Israel is true. That's right. Everything. It's all true. The Star of David is two Illuminati triangles. The Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and Rappers are all Illuminati agents. <laughs> Say it isn't so, Jay-Z. The Tooth Fairy is a Mossad agent searching for El Dorado under your child's pillow. But let's assume that every conspiracy is true. If About the creation of Israel, it's all true. Well, this would surely prove that it, Israel is not a creation of God. It's not a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, God doesn't use corrupted, unholy things to bring about his will and his kingdom, right? Well, the problem is four counterexamples quickly pop to my mind. Um, first, the Ark of the Covenant, where God dwelt between the cherubim. <laughs> it was made from Egyptian gold. Now, this same gold was given by the Egyptians to the Israelites when they left Egypt. And this same gold was used to create both the Ark of the Covenant and the golden calf. Think about that for a second. Now, okay, but gold is amoral. It's amoral. It's either moral or immoral. It's just a metal. All right. Uh, but what about the first temple built by King Solomon, David's son? Well, David actually got most of the materials from that, from Lebanon, from the different vassals, these pagan countries surrounding uh, Israel. There is even some evidence that giants were used from Lebanon to help create the temple. Okay, so the second temple. First one's destroyed, second one's built. Now this is the one that Jesus says is the house of God. Ouch, that's not just one strike, that's three strikes. Because number one, it was commissioned by the Persian pagan king. It was then... Uh, renovated by the, the King Herod, the Edomite, and overseen by the tyrannical and idolatrous Roman Empire. So what about Jesus? Surely the crucifixion of Jesus, the most holy event in the history of the world, was brought about purely by the hand of God without using any corrupt systems, peoples, governments, instruments. If you know anything about the crucifixion of Jesus, it was probably the most impure thing. And yet it accomplished the most pure thing, the most holy thing in history. But Jesus was betrayed. He was betrayed by his own disciple, one of his own. He was betrayed by the, the religious leaders. And he was a teacher, he was a Pharisee, and yet he was betrayed by the Pharisees. He was betrayed by his own people. And then he was turned over to a the King Herod and the governor, uh, Roman governor Pontius Pilate, and in an illegal trial, they sentenced him to death, and then tr uh, trespassing Roman soldiers killed him in one of the most gruesome, humiliating deaths known at that time. And it was all done in Jerusalem, the city of peace. <laughs> yeah. 
So here's the thing. God has to use unholy things. Corrupted things. And the evil choices of people. Because quite honestly, that's all we give him to work with. Now could the nation of Israel, the modern nation of Israel, even if everything we've said is true, every conspiracy is true, could it still be an example of God using corrupted and unholy and impure things to bring about his will? Maybe God is like a chess master who allows his opponent to assume control and to think that he's in charge, only to have played into the chess master's hand the whole time. Or the black belt in judo who uses the opponent's momentum and energy to take him off balance and defeat him. But before we draw a conclusion, it is time to consider probably the most dangerous and poisonous of the conspiracy theories. And this is that all of God's promises to Israel are now to be applied to the church. That's right. <laughs> Take out your Sharpie. Get out your KJV or the NIV, whichever one you like. And in the 2,500 times it says Israel, cross them all out and write in the church. That's right. Whenever God's talking about Israel, he's actually talking about the church. See, <laughs> changing the word of God is fun. Although it may be damaging to your eternal health and your retirement plan. But... Eh, lots of other people have done it. Yes, now that's another documenting. For now, replacement theology, as this view is often referred, is a poisonous cancer that has bred within the church uh, and has led to cruelty toward the Jews from very early on up through, <laughs> I mean, from the Crusades to the Inquisition to the pogroms to the Holocaust and even now the anti-Semitism that is ripe around the world. Many great Christian leaders, authors, and thinkers have fallen into this trap. Now, I think Chuck Misler put it best in his video on, called The Prodigal Heirs when he observed that God promised Abraham that his seed would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now, stars were often used to describe spiritual entities. And dirt and sand were used to describe physical entities. What if both the church and the Hebrew, the Israelites, the Jews, are seeds of Abraham? Believers in the Messiah from every nation, every tongue, are spiritual descendants. While the children of Israel, Jews, Hebrews, are physical descendants. Now this understanding puts a whole new light on Romans 11 and really helps to clear up the murkiness surrounded this idea of replacement theology. When I toured Israel in the summer of 2014, one of the people in our group, when asked by Jews why he was there in the middle of the Gaza war, he would respond that he was in love with a Jewish carpenter. People looked at him weird. <laughs> And aside, while on this tour, I had an enlightening talk with the, our tour bus driver at a kibbutz on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He lamented about all the anti-Semitism in the world. I asked him why he thought there was so much anti-Semitism. He said jealousy, maybe, but he didn't really know. Now, inspired by the Jewish carpenter-loving tourist, I went venture my own thought. And it goes to an off and misrepresented parable about sheep and the goats that Jesus gave. Many people apply this to how we treat the poor and the needy and the less fortunate. And while these are good applications, they're actually missing, I think, the point of this parable. Here's how Jesus opened the parable. Matthew 25, 31 through 33. When the, the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Now, the right hand was favor. If you extended, the king extended your right hand, or if you sat on his right hand, that was a good thing. If you sat on his left hand, that was usually a sign of punishment, or there's something bad going to happen. So if you right hand good, left hand, you're probably dead. Okay. So, um, now what is often missed is one word, brethren. Watch for it in how the king, Jesus, uh, will divide the sheep and the goats. 
verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Question. Who are Jesus' brethren? Now, replacement theologians would say the church, and they are partially correct. Spiritually speaking, all believers are grafted into the vine, as Paul talks about in Romans 11. And actually, Jesus says this as well. In his ministry, he said, if, if you're my disciple, if you're my follower, you are my brother, my sister, my mother. And he's saying you're family. Um, but my friend and mentor, uh, Mike Farrell, would often advise me. He would say, don't overlook the obvious. So, who are the obvious brethren of Jesus? Now, if you aren't at least saying Jews in your head, stop watching this video and go watch some paint dry because I've lost you. Um, <laughs> now, there's also a unique prophecy that Jesus gives as he's after he enters the city. So this is the Passover week of the, the week that he's betrayed and, and is crucified. He prophesies over Jerusalem. And he says in Matthew 23, 39, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Chuck Misler and others have pointed out this interpretation with which I totally agree. What Jesus is saying is that his second coming won't happen until the Jews come to him and call upon him. Similar to how the original story of Judah, uh, who had betrayed Joseph, only recognized Joseph after he repented and took responsibility for Benjamin. Now, if you don't know that story, it's a powerful story. But Judah, who was the one that sold Joseph into slavery, who had betrayed his brother, only when Judah took responsibility and in a way repented because Judah was going to take Benjamin's spot. I mean, I mean it's a great story. Benjamin was going to go to jail, according to the story at this point. And Judah was like, I'm not going to do this again. I messed up. And he, they, they lament this powerful, I mean, I'd be a fly on the wall. Judah's like, wow, I messed up. I betrayed my brother Joseph, who's dead. I'm not going to let Benjamin. And he repents. And when he does that, then Joseph reveals, it's I, Joseph. Now, it's ironic. Ironic's not the right word. I don't believe in coincidence. I think it's foreshadowing that the Messiah is actually often referred to as both Messiah ben David, or the son of David, and Messiah ben Joseph, the son of Joseph. Now, the interesting thing is when Jesus came the first time, they were expecting Messiah ben David, but they got Messiah ben Joseph. <laughs> and now, as he's coming back the second time, he's going to come back as Messiah ben David, and the Church of America is expecting Messiah ben Joseph. Anyway, that's, that's another documentary for another day. So, back to anti-Semitism. Why so much? Another adage I've often used is this idea that the devil always overplays his hand. This has been very revealing for me because I know I'm on the right track when there's a lot of resistance. It's kind of a weird thing. But the devil attacks us where we are weakest uh, or the most important areas. No good general is going to waste their resources on strong, unimportant areas. Okay? They're going to focus on where it matters. So why is Satan so focused on the Jewish people? Why does he hate them so much? Because anti-Semitism is demonic. If you study World War II and the Holocaust, if you study the pogroms, if you study what happened to the Jews throughout history, whether the Inquisition or the, the bubonic plague, where the Jews were blamed for the bubonic plague because they kept sanitary laws, <laughs> which prevented the spread of bubonic plague, and they got blamed for causing it. But if you look at the history, the Jews have been, there has been an attack. This anti-Semitism is not just jealousy. It goes way, way, much, much deeper than that. Um, so why is Satan so focused? Now, I believe maybe he, <laughs> he listens to prophecy and pays attention better than the church does. He knows that the Messiah will return when and only when the Jewish people call for him. This convergence and unity among the spiritual and the physical descendants of Abraham is what Paul talks about in Romans eleven fifteen. For if there, 
He's talking about the Jews. Rejection means a reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? It gives me goosebumps thinking about that. The reason for this corrosive theory called replacement theology is that as long as the followers of the Messiah are persecuting the Messiah's brethren, the Jews, then the Jewish people will not look upon the one whom they have pierced. As Zechariah prophesies in Zechariah 12:10, And I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now think about Judah, the story of Judah with Joseph. When Judah repented, he, I mean, and when the Jews repent, then Jesus will return. And so that's why all these Christian, all these end times left behind, all these different apocalyptic things, the one thing that Christians have always missed is they've missed the role that the Jews play. Because Christians, as a Christian, I'm from Germanic heritage. I don't know if I have any Jewish heritage. Uh, heritage. I'd love it if I did, but I, my ancestors were hunting Romans in the Teutonberg Forest 2,000 years ago. I mean, I'm a Gentile, and yet I have been grafted in. I've been taken in. When the Jews, when they return, that I can't. I can't do anything to bring about the return of the Messiah. The Jews, they will be the ones. Now, as a as a lover of Jesus, uh, and I want to love his brethren, come back to them. As for the overplaying of his hand, the Holocaust was so clearly demonic, it woke up the world to evil and led to the fulfillment of prophecies regarding Israel. I remember in high school, my brother Eric gave me Treblinka. And I read this book about the um, Treblinka death camp, much like Auschwitz. Um, and it stays with you. I mean, and that level of evil. And then when you study World War II and you, you see how um, Hitler, uh, there's that there's a whole other documentary about Hitler here. But um, at the end of the war, when it was over, a military person would pull forces back to defend Berlin or the big cities <coughs> or but instead Hitler ramps up the concentration camps and death camps and try to kill more Jews what I mean something something devilish this way comes I mean that's evil and that's not just man's evil there's some demonic some otherworldly ultra evil <laughs> behind the Holocaust. Now, I think a similar overplay in the hand is going on right now. From ISIS to Oregon to Sudan to Nigeria, the persecution that is going on around this world towards Christians and toward Jews is tipping the hand. It's so, Things are being revealed. Um, I put a post elsewhere about Psalm 83 war, and I think that and right now there's conflict right now in Israel. They've been betrayed by the world, by America, and uh, well, in conclusion, I hope I've made the argument that my parents were right all along. God has brought the Jews back to Israel, and this is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, I don't, I'm not sorry that I questioned it. I encourage you to question it and test it. Now, there are some verses. Check those out. Free Surround it. Look them up. I'm not making this stuff up. This is in the Bible. And this is both no, Old Testament and New Testament. Um, so check it out yourself. Truth can and should be tested. I just finished uh, four years of science teaching. That really drills in science, the testing and the repeating. Well, test it. Test it for yourself. Now, lies don't like to be tested. 
They want you to just believe it, accept it, and move on. Truth can be tested. That's why truth has this nagging ability to stick around. Whereas lies, even though they can be spoken loudly and multiple voices and pushed, eventually the light of truth exposes them. Um, what is done in secret will be shouted from the housetop. There will come a day when the truth will have <laughs> its day in the sun. So is Israel fulfillment of God's promises to return the Jews, Israelites, to their own land? I think undoubtedly, yes. And you, confirmation, experimental data here, is all the wars that have occurred since Israel returned in 1948. And again, I'll do another document in another time, but those wars should have annihilated Israel or severely weakened it. Especially the 67, the War of Independence in 48, the 67 Six Day War, and the Yom Kippur War. Uh, the Yom Kippur should have decimated Israel. Uh, the Six Day War should not have turned out as well as it did for Israel. And the War of Independence, the Jews should have all died. And yet they didn't, which is again confirmation that God is behind the scenes working. And it's actually interesting. Uh, I was talking to a Muslim friend of mine, and he was recounting these, and he was these wars, and he's saying repeatedly that America intervened. America intervened. The only reason that Israel is still there, the Jews are still there, is because America keeps saving them. Well, I know America has been involved and has supported Israel, but the Six Day War was over before we could even get over there. Now, the Yom Kippur War, I do think we, we intervened. Uh, later in that war actually the six day war we made them stop <laughs> but uh, uh america has been a supporter of israel and i'm very proud of that but israel has survived because god is protecting them and i think right now the world and especially that part of the world is being emboldened because america's withdrawing his hand but what they don't understand is god hasn't and that's, again, the post on the Psalm 83 war. Now, well, there are many complexities that can pollute, confuse, and obscure the truth. As we have examined each one of these, um, I think the waters have settled a little bit, and the truth has become clear. A closing thought. As a Christian, I believe that God has offered salvation through the death, through the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is that my sins are forgiven. And this is why the New Testament is also known as a new covenant, okay, a covenant in the blood of Christ. And I have confidence in this, that when I die, I will go to heaven, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Christ did on the cross. Now, the problem is, if replacement theology, if these other theories are true, that God has replaced Israel, then all those promises to Israel, all those promises, he referred to himself repeatedly in the Old Testament as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he promises to David, this is why the son Messiah ben David comes from, he promises David that his descendant would be the Messiah and would reign forever, and would rule over the whole world. And if the promises to God, if all the promises to God made to Israel are void and canceled, and God can just rip up that contract, rip up that covenant, then where do I stand? I mean, if God is that bipolar, then where does that leave Christians? Now, the good news is God is not bipolar. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the promises that he made to Israel are still in effect. The prophecies regarding Israel are still in effect. And thankfully, the promises God has made to you and to me as believers in Jesus is still in effect. And he is not a God that, he is not a man. God is not a man that he would lie. And so, when we look at Israel, we have to think of it more long term and say, okay, if God made these promises to Israel, yeah, he's going to fulfill them. If God makes promises to me, he's going to fulfill them. And that should give us confidence. So, is Israel the real deal? Is it a dynamic democracy? Absolutely. Actually, it's a place on, with human rights as far as letting Muslims and Druze and homosexuals and minorities vote and be part of the process is unparalleled. It is a key dynamic democracy. Is it an ally of the U.S.? Absolutely. 
has helped us out a lot, and we've helped it out a lot. So that's true. Is it fulfillment of prophecy? I think it is. Um, and I think the verses below and that showed earlier should prove that, but test it out yourself. Go check those out. Um, now, is it the fruit of a cabal? Maybe, but I don't think the evidence is really point to the worldwide Jewish cabal. Now, Luciferian cabal, maybe there's something to that. But even if it is, I think God used that. Much as the same way Satan tried to kill Jesus, and there was a conspiracy to kill Jesus. And yet, that played into what God was trying to do the whole time. So, there may be some truth to that. I'm not totally denying that part, but I think it's worked out for what God has intended. Now, is it the reason for all the ills in the Middle East? No, no. Actually, Jews and Israel, they want to bless their neighbors, and they've tried their best to bless. And this goes back to the promises in the Bible, in Genesis 12, 3, and in many other places, where it says those who bless the descendants of Abraham, Israel, will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And you see that in the Middle East. Jordan has been at peace with Israel for 30, 40 years, and they have been blessed. Whereas Syria has been funding terrorist <laughs> Hezbollah, to attack Israel, and look what's happening in Syria right now. Um, so the countries that have blessed Israel have been blessed, and the countries that have cursed Israel have been cursed. Um, so Israel wants to be a blessing. Now, you know, there's a lot more to that, but the, I think the core, the truth is, Israel and the people of Israel, when I was there, they don't want war. Uh, they hated the fact that they were having to bomb Gaza, and they were disgusted by how the Hamas would would protect their missiles with babies and children. Actually, we interviewed a, a soldier in the hospital who said he came into a room, and they, this was from the Gaza War, came into a room and they had hung a baby on a hook in the entryway of the home. And so the soldiers, when they came through that door, they're distracted by the baby who was still alive and crying or screaming. They're distracted by the baby, and that's when the Hamas gunman popped up and shot and killed three of the other men. So they're discuss I mean, Israel is, the Jews want peace. They don't want war. And um, so I don't think they're the cause of all the problems in the Middle East. <laughs> just, it just doesn't make sense. Um, are they um, an abomination? Again, God has used unholy things before, and he'll use unholy things again. Uh, he's going to use, he's going to work all things together. And his, his kingdom is going to come. Uh, and his will will be done. So, I think Israel is a real deal. And I think the evidence, as you test it yourself, as you really look into what the prophecies say, what God is, the consistency of God, his, the old covenant and the new covenant. Actually, and even that, we have a misunderstanding in, in, in the Christian church about covenant. We think Christ abolished the old covenant. No, he didn't. He came to interpret it, which means, he says, to fulfill it, which is another idiom, uh, to interpret it correctly. So the Old Testament and the Old Covenant is not passed away. It's actually been expanded upon a new covenant. God actually, Jesus gave us two additional commandments. If you, if you don't know that, we actually have 12 commandments, which is a whole other documentary. Yeah. So well, anyway, thank you for uh, joining me today. Uh, I would love to hear um, your comments, your thoughts. If you like this video, please share it. If you have uh, things you want to point out to me, please share them with me. Oh, by the way, that picture of that... Uh, Jewish carpenter loving tourist. I have a picture of him. No, 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 not not the Jewish carpenter, the tourist. The, although that is one of my favorite images of Jesus. Here, here's. Well, so I have a simple philosophy that's going to has always guided my discussions, my teachings, and what I've written. Is truth is absolute. My understanding of truth, however, is relative. In other words, I can and am wrong. I am wrong. I am wrong. Now, I don't know where I'm wrong. That's where a community, that's where we share with each other. You can point out where I'm wrong. I can kind of help you maybe see some things where you're wrong. Everything I currently believe, I believe is true. However, if you can point things out to me and show me that I'm wrong, I'm going to change that. I'm going to modify my stance. I'm going to modify my beliefs. I'm going I try to remain teachable, even at my late age of 23 would you believe no okay but anyway even at my age whatever it is uh i try to remain teachable I, you know i may be bristly at first 
Actually, there's a uh, plant in Israel called the Savra plant, which is bristly on the outside, but juicy and tender on the inside. Um, and that's what native-born Israelis are called. They're called Sabras. And I think that's true. Me, little, I can be a little bristly on the outside, but I try to remain tender on the inside. Um, so please share your opinions. You know, like, comment, uh, share, subscribe. You know, all the stuff you do with YouTube videos. I am, The good news is about a, a, a new YouTube channel. I've been doing this for a year, but it's been more of a hobby. Now I'm doing it more officially and trying to do a, a little bit more <laughs> editing and some, some things. Um, is when you comment on my post, I'm going to respond. I mean, you're going to get a quick comment and uh, we can build this community and, and build this dialogue. So my hope is that honest seekers will learn from each other and help each other in our search for the truth. There's a saying in Israel that our tour guides said a lot, and then we repeat it and kind of became the joke, but it was very true. They would say, two Jews, three opinions. Disagreeing with each other should not divide a family. Shouldn't divide people that care about each other or that are seeking the same thing. I'm seeking truth. And if you're seeking truth, us disagreeing shouldn't divide us. It should be a case and chance for us to discuss and both learn from each other as iron sharpens iron so disagreeing shouldn't divide a family it's actually one of the things that proves we are a family 